as a film um, or video maker, do you see yourself in a particular role as a maker or educator of gay and lesbian images or of images of people of color? Of course. <laughs> Um, I'm assuming that you, uh, let me ask you a thing, uh -huh. do you, are your questions going to be in, in this sort of a, do I need to answer your questions in a way that incorporates your question into my response? Actually, if you could kind of like repeat my question. Okay, that's and what then, I was saying, yeah. so yeah, okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure if it was going to be like a dialogue or, right. or what, okay. No, it's, yeah. <coughs> sure. Okay. Um, I ask your question then one more time. Okay. So um, as a film video maker, do you see yourself in a particular role as a maker or educator of gay and lesbian images or images of people of color? Oh, I think that my work is definitely about trying to destroy certain misconceptions of what it means to be gay or black or a person of color and to really challenge these very entrenched notions of our identities in a way that excludes many of us from being a part of communities that we in fact belong to. So that one who is African American and particularly um, is into the African American community cannot be gay. Or the image of what it means to be gay excludes black people, at least in terms of popular culture and popular mythology. And in many ways I think our own communities of gay and lesbian people tend to internalize that too. So you see within the gay and lesbian press, within books, within fiction, within the academy, that kind of privileging, often of whiteness, as the standard of what it means to be gay. So in particular, I see my work as trying to offer transgressive representations against all of what seems to be very stereotypical in most of our thinking. Uh, cool. Got in much of the recent critical writings and newspaper articles written about the representation of lesbians and gay males in mainstream and independent film production, there has been a deficit in the dialogue about women filmmakers and filmmakers of color and images of lesbians and gays of color. Do you have any in opinions or insight towards this lack? Um, that, that, I mean, that question can go in so many different directions. Um, I mean, maybe we should confine it as to who you're talking mm -hmm. t talking about in terms of production. Because you're talking about Hollywood, mm -hmm. then obviously simply the lack of people of color, the absence of women in general, is problematic. If you're talking about gay and lesbian cinema, that is, cinema produced by gay and lesbian people, in many ways I find that that too reflects many of the paradigms you find in mainstream movies except here the gay and lesbian characters you know, are gay and lesbian, uh, but they're white still. Um, I mean, we can't escape the reality that within gay and lesbian America, racism continues to pervade uh, this world as it does elsewhere in America. Uh, and to that degree, what you see in the cinematic representations exclude people of color. We simply don't count. We're not part of the picture in the way, the way people imagine their lives and the way they also, in fact, often live their lives. Um, at the same time, um, as I think you see generally within the culture, women who have been historically disenfranchised, uh, lacking the means in order to um, speak as well as represent themselves, you find that too happening, I think, in gay movies. Particularly if you look at the more successful crossover gay cinema. And I say gay because it really has not included that much in terms of women. There's been a few, of course, breakthroughs, but by and large, much of the movie making that we see coming out of our community uh, is about and by men. Uh, and that's, again, not mm -hmm. to be unexpected because historically men in our society, um, whether they're gay or whether they're straight, are privileged. I mean, patriarchy is patriarchy, and particularly if you're white and you can pass to some degree, you can enjoy the privileges of maleness. Uh, so women fall short in that kind of paradigm, and so do people of color. Um, I think, though, that that is changing. It's not some monolithic picture. Uh, the belief that there are no women, particularly lesbian filmmakers out there, uh, that there are no women of color who are doing works that address our issues as gay and lesbian people. Um, that 
often gets overlooked whenever you see mainstream press talking about our cinema. Uh, and even when you see the mainstream press talking about black cinema, there's no acknowledgement of the tremendous variety of work d being done by women as well as gay and lesbian people uh, in our African American as well as other communities of color. It's as if the only people leading the, the sort of pack of production right now are men and men in a way that really don't challenge in some fundamental ways patriarchy. Uh, often those movies, and I'm talking here about mm -hmm. black cinema, privilege again black males as the heroes, as the protagonists, to the exclusion of everybody else, to the exclusion of course of women, but also to the exclusion of people who don't fit as men the macho image. So if you're not in the inner city, if you're not able to tough it out, if you don't have the rhetoric down, uh, if you're not fighting for turf, your story is not worthy. Um, and I think that, that that is changing, whether it's Daughters of the Dust, you know, whether it's Isaac Julian's work, uh, whether it's my own work. Um, I think that there are inroads being made by a number of people who are challenging these kinds of representations. You, um... And this has just come off to the first bit of tape. Also erasing the history of women's representations and women's own filmmaking uh, as sort of this new gay aesthetic is being, you know, proclaimed. Well, I don't think there's one any central aesthetic, but also mm -hmm. I think that there have been a number of people who have been challenging what even we define as cinema for some time. Right. So that there are differences and conflicts and struggles that are happening within our own communities around representation uh, and who defines what's representative, who defines what's culture in this case of cinema. Um, that is going on, and so if you ask questions in a way that confine it to that community, I think I can be more specific, more focused in my answers. Or just tell me mm -hmm. sort of where okay. you, yeah. what, what actually communities are you talking right. about? Well, it seems, um, for instance, in Ru B. Ruby Rich's um, article that was in The Voice, um, that she did allude a little bit, in like one paragraph's worth or whatnot, um, to the barriers toward women getting films out there in this new gay cinema movement. Um, it, I felt like that article did not spend enough time on that. I mean, um, it didn't spend nor did it spend enough time, time on a number of issues. On a number of issues, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, she I spoke mean, a lot about Tom Kalin's work exactly. or Todd Haynes' work and stuff like that. Um, but basically, I can't recall her really talking about work from people of color or work from women that is out there, or perhaps the barriers that are there as far as um, the snobbery that goes between film and video and trying to get your work out there if the festivals aren't accepting video work. I mean, and I think we also have mm -hmm. to interrogate what we mean by cinema. There are many people who are deliberately choosing not to try to make those mainstream movies that is feature length which you will show in theaters that is not their aim their aim is mm -hmm. to do different kinds of work work that perhaps is more experimental in style more personal more demanding of an audience in terms of its interpretation and engagement with the work <clears throat> i'm having sort of a reaction to some of this paint <coughs> excuse me could you give me some water sure. um <coughs> Sorry about that. That's I okay. Sort of <coughs> yeah, it's kind of strong in yeah. here. Let's see if I can stay in here. Maybe if I just keep opening the window. <laughs> I <laughs> just didn't you insert this, you know. <coughs> That's New York. Yeah. <coughs> but I guess what I was getting at is that um, we need to constantly define what we mean by cinema, gay and lesbian cinema, um, and what kinds of expectations underlie our assumptions of uh, what we should be striving for. That many of us deliberately are not trying to break through into that kind of Hollywood mold of what is cinematic. Uh, many of us are actually content with not so much the smaller audiences that we might be getting, but the kinds of forms that we're using in telling our stories. Um, so that, you know, that kind of comparison and looking at sort of our inability to reach certain audiences as being barriers because we're not looked at uh, somehow as professional or having sort of a, quite acquired the tools of those people who are doing more breakthrough mm -hmm. crossover cinema. 
Uh, many of us are using our work in a very different way and using it to politicize audiences in a different way, I think. And are not simply there in this kind of uh, generic way, simply trying to tell stories. We're actually trying to engage in some manner in social change. Uh, and the sites may be more specific, may be more focused, but I think that struggle, the work that comes out of that motivation is far more intense in terms of its effect on people. And I think that's important. We often, when we define these terms gay aesthetic or gay lesbian cinema, overlook that, overlook the different strategies and the different audiences, the different motivations that exist behind the work we do. And that needs to be reckoned with before we can start heralding some gay aesthetic uh, or talking about the absence of women in this you know, more conventional cinematic arena, or people of color for that matter. You mentioned earlier a few names like Julie Dash or I can't remember the other names you mentioned. Do you, um, could you maybe speak a little bit about the, um, shall we say, underground um, movement that's going with independent filmmakers, particularly gay and lesbian um, filmmakers, but... Um I don't know how underground it is since <laughs> you can see the work if you simply know where it's showing. It's not as if we're doing it in secret or doing it in some kind of covertly subversive manner. I think much of the work that we are doing is subversive of many mainstream conventions, but I don't know if underground would be an accurate term to describe a work like Tongues Untied or mm -hmm. Julie Dash's Daughters of the Dust or Isaac Julian's Young Soul Rebels are looking for Langston. Um, I think much of that work is trying to counter the hegemony of classic cinema and even our own internalized aspirations for that look, for that kind of romantic storytelling in which we get in many ways a kind of narrative in which the players are bisexual or gay or lesbian but the stories aren't really that different from what we see normally in Hollywood conventional movie making that we're really trying to challenge expectations, challenge assumptions, challenge the relationships that we have as viewers to those images of us and thereby challenge our own images our own imagination about ourselves and our relations with each other. Um, so, I mean, I think that many people are actually actively engaged in that kind of work uh, because it's not as high profile as, for instance, my own private Idaho. Uh, because the work, in some ways, I think, is at times more affirmative of our relationships than some of these more successful movies. And I think that needs to be questioned why so many of the movies that are crossing over now tend to present homosexuality as pathological. Now, I'm not saying that we should all be restricted to doing only positive images of us as successful and well-adjusted, happily in relationships for, the, for 15 years, but when you see a pattern over and over again in which the only people that get represented in our community are those in some ways that are vindictive, suicidal, murderous, and that's not simply because of straight folks representations of us but ours too one has to question what is really happening here um, but I think that many of us who are really dealing with the complexities of our identities and affirming that in a way affirming our differences um, and nurturing that uh, find the work not receiving as much attention and yet the work is reaching people and is catalyzing other people to create their own images of self of society to construct their own utopias uh, in a way. Um, and again, if I don't answer your questions, ask, I mean, if, if you need follow up. No, that, up. Was, that was really, Okay, but yeah, if you need to follow, uh -huh. just tell me, because sometimes okay. I'm not quite sure, so just tell right. me. Okay. You know. Yeah. Um, as far as getting your work out to the public, um, have you found any type of barriers or, or um, problems with getting distribution? Um, <coughs> have you found modes that have worked well, in your opinion, for your work? Um, or ways that you can imagine that the systems could be better or work better toward getting? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always realized that the kind of work I do has to have multifaceted venues of distribution. I don't privilege theaters. 
I mean, and there are many people who, if you don't show a work in a theater, it's not as if it's really that important. You haven't reached the pinnacle until your work, your cinematic, you know, achievement has been shown within a theater in a darkened room with you know, hundreds of people watching. And I don't think that that is the only critical site of intervening against the dominant representations of us as gay and lesbian people and as people of color. Um, I think it's important to reach people wherever they are. And that is in classrooms, so my work goes there. That is in churches, it goes there. It is in bars and, I mean, divey places that I have gone and presented work and spoken because that is where people are. And if they are unwilling to go into the theater or into the museum, which my work has been shown in those kinds of places too, then I will reach them where they are comfortable in order to begin that nurturance of personal and by extension political empowerment. Um, so I found it necessary doing the kind of alternative work that normally doesn't get picked up by you know major distributors that show within theaters, that it's necessary to follow all kinds of different distribution routes, community groups to actually contact different organizations, uh, to attend the festivals that are specifically addressed to our communities, and try to breach those places, those, for instance, organizations and festivals that normally see the world in kind of classically conventional terms, for instance, the Black Film Festival, which regards really only race as being the paradigm for us to understand our identities and does not acknowledge sexuality or class or in many ways a more problematic understanding of the di diasporan identities problematic in that they challenge us to rethink our own um, so I found that it's necessary to go to those places particularly after the success of my more if you will conventional work which they highly respect to say, okay, now deal with this. And because of the logic of them having accepted and recognized the merit of that, it's not easy for them to turn away something like tongues untied or affirmations. Um, and so I find, it, I find it necessary to do that kind of multifaceted approach uh, to reach people in all kinds of different settings and to really not internalize this belief that unless one shows work within a familiar Hollywood kind of framework you really haven't achieved. That's bullshit. Um, how would you define yourself as a filmmaker? Do you define yourself as a black gay filmmaker, as a black filmmaker? Does that change depending on where you're showing work? Has that changed as you developed in your work? <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? I mean or do you, uh, do you feel <coughs> that it's necessary to define yourself? I don't feel it's necessary to, for me to go, go through and try to, I mean, people ask me, what do you want to be known as? Uh, how should I describe you in this piece that I'm doing? Uh, I say I'm an independent documentary producer. If you want to say black gay filmmaker, fine. If you want to say gay black, fine. If you want to say black only, fine. I mean, I know in my own internal psyche that I am all of these things and more. Uh, and yet I find that it's necessary for people in order to get a handle on me and my work to box me. Um, and I think what I try to do is subvert that box, not by demanding a certain kind of label, but by simply doing the work that I do so that it defies the conventions of those kinds of categories. Um, so I really don't usually niggle those kinds of issues with people. Um, I let them call me whatever they want to. Now, I'm not one, however, who doesn't want to be known, for instance, as a black gay filmmaker because that will pigeonhole me in a way, um, and I really want to be known simply as a filmmaker. Uh, I mean, there are people who don't want to be known as a black filmmaker. They only want to be known as a filmmaker. Uh, and I think what that does is buy into the stigma associated with one's sexuality, with one's race. Because, for instance, we don't, when we hear the name Tolstoy, and Russian novelists think that that is somehow a denigration of his work. And yet, when we hear that in relation to black or gay or lesbian, preceding whatever they do, author, filmmaker, writer, whatever, it seems how somehow is diminishing their achievement and their stature. And I think that is because we have internalized 
uh, those dominant culture notions about those terms. And we need to constantly, constantly, I think, challenge that in ourselves and realize that our identities, our blackness, you know, our gayness, our lesbianness, uh, whatever it is that constitutes our uniqueness as individuals should be prized. That's what nurtures our creativity. That's what nurtures, I think, our political struggle and what makes us endure uh, despite adversity in the world. Um, so. Um, okay. Um, switching gears just a little bit. Um, your work has been shown on PBS. Um, I didn't, obviously I didn't mention that, but obviously public television too right. is one of the venues. <laughs> As one of the but you know, that's kind of obvious. How have you found PBS as a venue for <coughs> presenting your work? Um, problematic to say the least. I mean, most of my work has been shown on public television. At the same time, that does not guarantee because of the way that public television is structured and the ideology of the people who run public television that the work necessarily gets its proper due. Uh, particularly not simply because of who I am but because of how independent work generally is treated within the public television arena. Uh, that work gets marginalized as our communities in society at large are marginalized. Uh, so that, for instance, in Seattle, Tongues Untied was shown at 3 a.m. in the morning. You know, or in Portland, it's not shown at all, despite a huge gay and lesbian population. Uh, or in other cities, it's shown at 11 o'clock or at one o'clock in the morning. And one has to wonder, given the centrality these days of sexuality in so much of the struggles uh, in all of our communities, and not just in relation to AIDS, but into relations to of violence, of rape, of the kind of psychological torture with which we uh, treat each other, uh, the kind of abuse, the kind of internalized self-loathing that many people feel about their bodies and about their sexual identities, the repression, that this is a work that you would think, even though you may not be black or gay, is still relevant to you. But what, in fact, public television says, and the stations in particular say, by how they program, not only this work, my own, but all kinds of works that come from our communities, is that really this isn't that important. If you want to, you can stay up late and look at it, or you can tape it and get to it whenever you can. But as one station manager said when programming it at some god-awful hour in the morning, he wanted to make sure that no one ran across this by accident, and those who found it really wanted to see it, and not just those who happened by it. It said that really the work, therefore, wasn't really that important. Um, so I found that kind of, particularly in relation to work of mine that addresses issues of sexuality, race minus sexuality is much easier. Color adjustment already, for instance, is being heralded. I just had a, con a, a screening at Congress for the B Black Congressional Caucus, um, the National Black Journalists Association, the Black uh, AIDS, A-I-D-E-S of Congress. Uh, National Black Programming Consortium, I mean, it was like packed with the folk who didn't show up when Tongues Untied needed help. When I put out the call and letters and phone calls that this work, and by extension, this community, which is your community, is being bashed, and you need to address how censorship affects us all, closes debate, stifles expression, and represses our identities, that this is something that's at stake for you too. No one answered that call because it dealt with this taboo area of homosexuality. Now in color adjustment, which looks at constructions of the black family in primetime entertainment television, of course, primetime has erased sexuality from the get. So already you don't need to deal with it except as an absence. And I think because of that, it's a far more comfortable work for people to get behind. Um, so it depends upon what I do as to what kind of reception I found in public television. Uh, I think it will for any other work that I have and almost everything else that I'm doing now for the foreseeable future uh, addresses the intersection of sexuality and race and gender and class, nationalism 
And to that degree, I think those works will find it difficult, uh, difficulty getting tenure on primetime public television. I'm curious as to which uh, station told you that they had to, <laughs> to schedule Tongues Untied at a time when they made sure no one accidentally came across Oh, that was it. a Seattle station at 3 a.m. in the morning. Mm -hmm. wow. Um, I thought it was interesting last night with um, A Place of Rage, June Jordan speaks about how she um, went to speak at an anti-racism rally at a college and there were hundreds of people there and the next day there was a um, pro-gay rally and there was like 45 people there. And just, you know, she was talking about the importance that we all need to fight together you know, and that there was no reason, it was ludicrous that she could go to one rally and there was like four or five hundred people there, students, and the other rally there was just 45, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. which is interesting in what you're mm -hmm. saying about um, the difference in the way your work is received depending on what topic it's hitting mm -hmm. and whether the folks show or the folks don't, mm -hmm. you know, that mm -hmm. we all need to fight in these causes mm -hmm. together. Because I mean, we all maintain, I think, these very discreet notions of our identity and who we have affinity with so that we can, to some degree, get behind a struggle around censorship, if we feel that it affects us. But in so far as it's directly applied to gay and lesbian artists, cultural workers, and one doesn't see any direct connection to oneself, it's easy to ignore that struggle. And that happens over and over again. Or vice versa for white gays and lesbians, and this has been part of the problem within our traditional gay and lesbian communities, Issues of color, issues of race seem to be inconsequential in relation to gay and political, gay and lesbian political empowerment. So you find indifference there, which creates this kind of mutual apathy, but also suspicion and distrust. And the point is how do we get beyond that? How do we recognize our inherent intersexuality, um, our inherent uh, connections to each other uh, and see that you are a part of me, I am a part of you, that which threatens you threatens me and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And that our struggles are blended, not the same, not always the same, but they do connect. The right realizes this, that's the amazing thing. The right is so adept at realizing that you know, it's not simply, and you see this in how they go after different people. It's not just the old homosexuals with their pornographic work that are a threat to society. They go after people of color. They go after feminists. They go after people who are doing iconoclastic work that challenges in any way mainstream conceptions of art. They go after them, and they go after the institutions, more importantly, that have provided nurturance for this kind of transgressive cultural expression. They realize, one, the importance of cultural work as being central to, to, to political empowerment. They realize that. That's why so much attention is paid. And at the same time, they realize that much of this work, absent of any nurturance by our public institutions, would simply die. Hence, all of the, you know, all of the fight and struggle over the NEA, which has succeeded, given the recent testimony uh, by the acting chair, and now the battle over the public television funding. Right. It's a shame that, for instance, CPB, ITVS has been existing one year, and this might be it. Mm -hmm. You know, a program that took five mm -hmm. years to fight for. Exactly. Ten you know, years, actually. Ten years. Yeah. 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 And all based simply on two-line descriptions of what the first round of funded projects yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. Most of which, of course, that were attacked by the right, by the senators in Congress, dealt with were about communities of color, mm -hmm. which is very, very revealing. Yes. We are a threat. Just as a final question, I was wondering whether or not you would like to comment on the recent uh, misappropriation of your work um, for uses on the right agenda the blatant misappropriation. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've seen that time and time again, particularly in the last four or five years, whether it's Maplethorpe's work, whether it's Serrano's Piss Christ, 
um, whether it's Todd Haynes's Poison, per, you know, Paris is Burning by Jenny Livingston. I mean, over and over and over again, and you'll see it continuously too. It's not going to end. I mean, I think I'm just one more in this episode, sort of continuous episode of repression and the use of any work that challenges particularly hegemonic notions of appropriate sexuality, which typically even doesn't in itself deserve a public discussion, heterosexual or homosexual, but particularly homosexual, how that kind of misappropriation tries to control us and police our expression so that no one will be seduced in an intellectual and political way to a respect for our identities and for our communities. Um, and I mean, what you see over and over is the utter immorality of the right and the blatant distortion, falsification, ripping to shreds of work in order to assert their power, in order to control us. So I'm not shocked by it. I mean, people who are up against the wall will do anything in order to preserve uh, their preeminence in society. And that, I think, is what you're seeing, particularly in terms of white, heterosexual, heterosexist, homophobic patriarchy. You're seeing a community which has historically had privilege now being challenged, having been challenged really since the 60s in an effective way in which that kind of hegemony has been unraveling, but challenged in a way that now they see how it's not only the law, and it's not only government, it's not, long, uh, it's not only in business that one maintains power, but also through culture. Culture in some ways even more importantly because it's the way by which you inculcate the notions of who is entitled to privilege uh, before people actually receive it or earn it. Um, and realizing that uh, anything that can be done anything, no matter how distorting, no, how, no matter how gross, in terms of the kind of blatant misuse of work, goes. And I've seen that, of course, in my relation to my own work, not only with the Pat Buchanan um, misappropriation of Tongues Untied in his campaign ad in Georgia, which then played in other places of the South, but also how the Christian coalition excerpted seven minutes of the tape, reduced it to this disjointed, hideous, totally grossly butchered piece of curse words, ripping all of everything out of context. So it seemed like all I had done was simply string a bunch of non sequitur non obscenities and call that art. And then having the nerve to send that to Congress in order to influence content restrictions on the NEA. But again, you're seeing you know, how these notions of family values, the taxpayer, the American public are being used in a way to exclude us and also to maintain this very monolithic, uh, imaginary, imaginary, mythic concept of American community a community that is composed of like-minded people who resemble the Jesse Helmses and the Reverend you know, Falwells uh, and, and so forth of the world. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's chilling because, again, I don't think oftentimes we realize what's really at stake. We respond in a sort of piecemeal way, you know, depending upon who's attacked, to the challenge against our voices, against our expression against our right to expression. But it's not as if black people realize what's at stake when gay people are silenced, or what gay people realize when women are silenced, or what women at times, feminists realize when African Americans are silenced. And of course, I'm speaking feminists here who are white feminists. Uh, it's as if one can look at that in a kind of detached way and perhaps argue against censorship, but it's not in any way a mortal threat. and and. I think, and I'm not exaggerating here, it is a mortal threat when our right to simply speak and to be heard in the public discourse, meaning that kind of discourse which is financed by our public institutions, is being stripped away. When we are being policed and when our identities effectively are being erased within society.
Get back in the closet. Bow your head. Submit. Be quiet. That's what we're being told. And many of us are only beginning to hear that and to respond accordingly. I heard once, um, I can't remember where I heard it from, um, that usually when society is on a crux of a major kind of like tempo morale change, that the most violence comes out, the most, say, misappropriation, the most twisting of ideas of that which threatens those in power starts to occur. And in a way, we're starting to see that. Mm -hmm. um, I think in the late 80s, you know, rising up again, right up to the, the L.A., you know, incidents, the, the national incidents actually is not only L.A., mm -hmm. um, even Toronto, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, type of thing. No, I mean, I think definitely that our society is coming to a head, uh, that the kinds of volcanic eruptions of violence, the cultural civil wars that go on now, uh, the backlash against feminism, the hysterical uh, pro-life quote-unquote movement um, is an attempt to try to return this society to the veneer of civilization that people once believed in. It never existed, of course, but it was a veneer that people accepted as truth. And you find people unwilling to, despite the overwhelming pressures of society and all of the populations that are just perforced by being here, ushering in a new order, a new kind of society, you find people refusing to go, refusing to move, refusing to be budged, and wanting to not only hold where we presently are, but to return us back to those glorious days uh, that the kinds of volcanic eruptions of violence, the cultural civil wars that go on now, uh, the backlash against feminism, the hysterical uh, pro-life quote-unquote movement, um, is an attempt to try to return this society to the veneer of civilization that people once believed in. It never existed, of course but it was a veneer that people accepted as truth. And you find people unwilling to, despite the overwhelming pressures of society and all of the populations that are just perforced by being here, ushering in a new order, a new kind of society, you find people refusing to go, refusing to move, refusing to be budged, and wanting to not only hold where we presently are, but to return us back to those glorious days when we didn't have any of these problems, when faggots and dykes were not even known to exist, were never acknowledged, when black people knew their place and accepted it, so-called in the myth, where women had their place and nurtured family and didn't exacerbate tensions in the household or in the workplace or in the w political arena when we didn't have to deal with third world populations, we didn't have to deal with our responsibilities to the environment, where things simply seem to be okay. And that world, of course, will not return. It never really existed, but it definitely will not return because we are not going to go back into closets to bow our heads. We are not going to return to cooking and cleaning and doing the domestic work. Those days are over uh, and the right has not quite realize that and I think you're seeing the kind of fervor from that community in order in part to continue to deny the inescapable reality which is coming upon them. In the words of uh, the Anita Hill trial, they just don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. I mean I think the 21st century is going to see major cataclysms I mean, the Rodney King verdict and the rioting that occurred and the kind of malaise as well as just general conv convulsions, we're going to see much more of that to the degree that we continue to deny the contradictions in our social reality. And it's going to occur in pockets. It will not occur in the kinds of pockets where we can feel that it's isolated and removed from us. 
it will continue to come closer and closer to home, wherever home may be. And that will force change. And unfortunately, it may be bloody, but I don't think it has to be with the degree that we continue to engage in this pathological denial of reality. We only create the kind of powder keg that will someday result in a major social explosion and devastation. I mean, people just seem so disconnected in general. It's not simply our own progressive communities. I and mean, if you just talk to people, what goes on in New York is utterly foreign to what goes on here. Um, yeah, you know, in, 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 in California. You know, what goes on in my neighborhood, which can be only two blocks away, is remote, utterly remote from what goes on here down the street. A, a school district fails in this state or in this district, and it does not matter to me, as long as I seem to be getting mine, and my family, if I have one, seems to be getting theirs. Uh, and that kind of general alienation is suicidal for a community, because no community can exist that way. I mean, and it's, it's dangerous that that kind of disconnection is being fed through our media, through our politics, through even, I think, our cultural movements, even at times through our progressive movements, which tend to sort of balkanize politics and identity issues in a way in which I cannot talk to you and you cannot talk to me unless one of us is seen as wrong and one of us is seen as right. And of course, I have to be right and so do you, so that you know it, it reaches an impasse and which all we can do is accuse each other of being racist or sexist, misogynist. Well, you, you know mm -hmm. the terms. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And any kind of interchange that allows for both of us to grow and begin to actually comprehend each other and then to find some affinity that allows us to move as community, to weave community, is prohibited. I mean, and that's, and for me, that's the state of America. It's not just the left that enacts that kind of, that kind of, I don't know, I'm sort of losing it a little bit because I'm getting tired, but it's, it's not just the left that enacts that kind of dynamic where we don't seem to go beyond our rigid boundaries of identity and politics, our comprehension of the world. It's America. I found sometimes a problem with the left or problem that I've had is that often there's some people who are so eager to do the right thing, quote unquote, that they forget about the baggage that they bring to that mm -hmm. and they're not willing to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And if it is pointed out, it causes explosions. Mm -hmm. And not pointed out, I mean in an in alienating, ostracizing mm -hmm. way, but it, it causes mm -hmm. explosions mm -hmm. because their mind's in the right place or their heart's in the right place, but their mind always isn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as far as the way information is being um, processed. Mm -hmm. And that that's something that as a left side, um, I think we need to figure out a deal because we're, we're disparate and the right is organized, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and we need to figure out how Supremely to deal organized. with that. Yeah. Supremely organized, yeah. supremely. Yeah. Just in terms of logistics of being able to marshal the forces when need be mm -hmm. to get out the letters, to get people, right. we're so, alienated and cynical and jaded mm -hmm. uh, that we simply allow ourselves to be bashed with impunity.